And I'm Fred Hopengarten, K1VR. And uh, we're going to talk about, every year at uh, Dayton, we talk about different topics. We never talk about the same thing twice. And this year, I'm going to be talking about uh, the subject that comes up in a lot of uh, local ordinances. If you're out there looking to get a permit and your town has a wireless, uh, has a personal wireless services ordinance or a wireless communications facilities ordinance generally caused by the Telecommunications Act of 96, which is the advent of cellular telephone. So PWS, personal wireless service, WCF, wireless communications facility. What's the difference? There's no difference. It's just the wording that your town chose to put into the new bylaw that they passed sometime after 96, usually before 98 and 99. And the real problem is that they generally, uh, when they were drafting these things, they always have a definition section. And the definition section sometimes reads something like a uh, device which can transmit and receive radio signals. Well, that means your baby monitors and TVs and your cell phone are all included. And, uh, so when someone pointed that out to a lot of these towns, they said, oh, and requires an external antenna. Well, that means that your car <laughs> and your boat and anything else you have a radio on is also included, and you might have to get a special permit for that. Well, obviously, they never intended that. It's just sloppy drafting. Now, I want to tell you every lawyer on the planet is a great lawyer and a good draftsman, but it's just not true. It's what I want to tell you. It's just not true. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about me. This is the uh, pitch where I say, you know, you really should be a member of the ARRL, especially if you're going to call one of us who's a volunteer council and ask for help. You know, it would be nice if you're a member of the league when you're asking for the free help because it's a member benefit and you're not really entitled to the benefit unless you're a member. I hope you can follow that logic. In any event, I am a volunteer council and uh, as you'll see by the certificate for, uh, that says full member on the far side of the screen, I've been a member since 1956. I'll give you the rest of the hour to do the arithmetic. And I do support the league myself and I'm a member of the Diamond Club and I hope you too will contribute. Uh, in addition to the talk I'm going to give today, I have recorded a six-part series uh, on antenna zoning for the ARRL webinar uh, system. And I know that you can't read the entire URL, nor am I going to read it for you right now. But if you want to find it, you can dig it out on the ARRL webpage whenever it comes up. And uh, if you don't do that, you can always just send me an email and I'll forward you this presentation, including all the URLs, which are in type too small for you to read from the audience. So let's begin with a typical um, ordinance that is actually somewhat well written. Uh, and I'm giving you real examples that have recent, that have, the examples I'll be giving have all come up basically within the last year for me in Medfield, Massachusetts. WG5I asked me to look at their local ordinance because he had been told that as a result of their personal wireless service ordinance, he could only put up a tower that was 40 feet tall. Well, it turns out it isn't true, but it sure looked like it to the building officials because they began by taking a look at the definition of a personal wireless service, and it says radio communication services specifically identified as personal wireless services. Well, it sounds like they were doing a good job, only PWS, personal wireless services, is not exactly the wording that the FCC used. It's just the wording that the local lawyer decided to use. However, they were kind enough to go on and give us a good hint because such services include cellular, personal communication services, enhanced specialized mobile radio services, among others. There's your problem because sometimes the locals say, well, ham radios among others, isn't it? Uh, the answer is no, uh, but you wind up with bad drafting causing a lot of heartache and grief. However, um, let me just say that there's also one, more than one place to look for definitions. I was looking initially at personal wireless service, which I thought was helpful, and then I looked at personal wireless tower. So you walk in, you say, I want to get a tower, 
and they look at tower first and then they get misled because the definition of personal wireless tower is personal wireless antennas at a personal wireless facility. Well, you have personal wireless services defined and you can live with it, but you don't have personal wireless facility defined, and that certainly begins to sound like the other widely used term, wireless communications facility, which is a term defined in the 96 Act and specifically defined. So let's take a little bit of a look at the Federal Act, which specifically identifies personal wireless services, PWS. Um, and it means commercial mobile services on licensed wireless service and common carrier wireless exchange access services. Well, you really have to be an FCC lawyer to enjoy that kind of writing. But wire, wire, common carrier wireless exchanges is sort of hearkening back to the days of plain old telephones, if you remember those days. Uh, is, is there anyone in the room young enough to be confused when I say, <laughs> in, in any event, um, you do get these cross definitions. The term personal wireless service facility, facilities means the provision of personal wireless services. Okay, so the question became, does it apply in this particular town? And you know, we have hundreds of thousands of cities and towns I can't read them all to you in a one hour talk or a five or seven minute talk as this is, but I'll give you an idea of what this particular one says. And it says, uh, it, it provides you with an out, as it were. Uh, first of all, we've, in this particular town, we've managed to get out because even to the dumbest planner, and uh, no comment further, uh, you can probably convince them, that, say again? Is there anything else? <laughs> but I duplicate myself. Um, the, uh, the, the next place to go is don't think of yourself as a personal wireless service facility or wireless communications facility or a personal wireless tower. Think of yourself as an ordinary accessory use. But they weren't kind enough in this particular town to use that very common phrasing. Instead, they decided to call an ordinary accessory use a necessary, a pertinent structure. You know, why use a common phrasing when you can use an uncommon phrasing? Uh, but in this case, we happen to have the benefit of the fact that it actually includes communications tower, mast, antenna, aerial. Now, I'm looking for the engineer or lawyer who's going to help me distinguish and answer the question of why do they have an antenna and an aerial. If you have a good idea, please tell me. But I tell you that it's... Uh, more realistically, sloppy drafting. Uh, now, the, here's where, th there, are, there are two more parts of this particular accessory use section that invite you to do some investigating. Number one, is your ham radio communications tower, mast, antenna, or aerial a necessary a pertinent structure? Now, in my case, what's necessary is a 100-foot tower. Uh, but somebody might decide that what you want to put up, perhaps more modest, perhaps more extravagant, is not a necessary a pertinent structure. The way I attack that is I go to W1UE who will produce a uh, study on prop with propagation maps of the kind that you see in cellular telephone service telling you about what the coverage opportunities will be with your tower. And basically what we want to do is prove that to you as an individual, 75 feet, 125 feet, whatever it is you are thinking about is necessary for your purposes because you are the person that counts under PRB1. It's a subjective test. It's you, not some rogue ham who thinks a dipole at 12 feet is adequate to communicate around the world when the sunspots are at 228. Um, what we're going to be talking about, though, is the rest of the sentence, which 
deals with the setbacks. And here's where it drives me crazy, because it says that the setback shall be increased one foot horizontally for each two feet of height exceeding the height permitted in the district. So you've got to parse that literally word by word. Um, and here's the way you'd kind of do it. Uh, in fact, I think I may have an example later. But basically, you're going to take the permitted height. And let's say the permitted height is 50 feet. And you want to go to 60 feet. So you're going to go up 10 feet above the permitted height, which is going to increase the setback by 5 feet. Nobody's with me. I see blank faces. OK? You're with me on the math. So this proves to you that even if you go to law school, you still have to remember a little bit of arithmetic. Now, I've described to you what I think will be the necessary appurtenant antenna in this particular town for this particular radio amateur. But there are some little tricks to that. First of all, when you go and look at what an appurtenant structure is, they don't actually define it in this particular town's bylaw. In many towns, an accessory structure is well defined, and it's easy to say ham radio is an, an ordinary accessory use of a residence. But you don't know what an appurtenant structure is. You've got to go searching around for a commonly accepted definition. Fortunately, the insurance industry has looked hard at the question of what's an appurtenant structure. And FEMA, I'm, the tiny little lettering tells you that I got this definition from the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency. It's a FEMA.gov website. It says that an appurtenant structure is a building of lesser value, in other words, it's not the principal structure, located on the same premises as the main building insured under a property insurance policy. Now, it turns out this is both in conflict with federal law, but still very helpful to you. Uh, and the reason is, under PRB1, you're entitled to put an antenna on an otherwise blank, empty lot. This, however, would require you to build a house in order to put up an antenna, which seems to me like a classic case of a very large tail wagging a big dog, uh, or, or however you want to use that phrase, because you have to have a house before you're allowed to have an antenna. This also means that if you happen to own two lots side by side and you want to put the tower up on the next door lot, you've got a problem if you're in Medfield, Massachusetts, unless you convey the second lot to yourself and make it all one big lot, which, depending on the city or town you're in, may increase or decrease your taxes, your per personal, uh, your real estate property taxes. Um, and now I said, I, I promised you I'd do the calculation. Uh, basically, setback goes up one foot for each two feet of height that exceeds the height in the district. Well, you go to the table of height and bulk regulations. You find out in this particular town, in this particular district, the height in the district, maximum height is 35 feet. And the setback in the district, now, you just have to look at only one of these because you're only going to look at the closest setback. You don't have to look at them all because only the closest one is applicable. So in his particular situation, we're going to put the antenna in a spot in his yard where 15 feet is the closest setback. So for a 75-foot tower, which is what he wants, if the side lot line closest is going to allow 35 feet plus 40 over 2, 35 plus 40 being the 75-foot tower he wants, that's 20 feet of additional side lot setback for a 75-foot tower. You add 15 feet of side setback to 20 feet, and the new setback will be 35 feet, which is no problem in his particular situation. The actual numbers in his particular case are not the takeaway. The point is you've got to read this stuff word by word to figure out how much you're allowed to have before we get into a fight about whether or not they have limited you to a firm fixed 
absolute maximum height, which is probably illegal in a lot of states and a lot of circuits of the uh, United States Circuit Courts. Now, here's an other example that just popped up two weeks ago in Kootenai County, Ohio. Uh, excuse me, Idaho. We began by looking at the definition section. You, uh, that lawyer I, I, I know once told me he would allow a client to sign absolutely anything as long as he got to write the definitions and the effective dates. And here's an example of a definition being helpful. A wireless communications facility in Kootenai County, Idaho, is this broad definition, any facility designed and used for the purpose of transmitting, receiving, or relaying voice and data signals. And again, I suggest to you, that's a baby monitor, a television, the radio in your bathroom, and you might need a permit for it if, because it's defined here as a wireless communication facility. However, they let you out if you keep reading. Uh, it's, WCFs include sighting areas, transmission towers, and antennas. That's not relevant to this discussion. This definition shall not include towers less than 20 feet. One wonders, you might have a tower that's less than 20 feet, but your bathroom radio doesn't use a tower, so is it a wireless communications facility? Or facilities with towers less than 40 feet in height? So the answer is, your bathroom radio is not a wireless communications facility because, maybe because it's a facility with a tower less than 40 feet, but is your bathroom radio antenna a tower? I don't know, maybe you still have to get a special permit. Bad drafting can be found on the East Coast and in the center of the country as well. Um, so in this particular county in Idaho, they are, have been taking the position that he can't put up anything over 40 feet in height without a special use permit. Because the CEO, a new phrase in your life, the code enforcement officer, thinks that ham radio towers are wireless communications facilities. I've suggested to you they are not. And that they are limited to 40 feet without a special permit. And I think that's wrong. I say, what's a ham radio tower? Well, again, in Kootenai County, Idaho, it's a structure accessory to and detached from a residential structure. So this is a very different definition than the appurtenant structure definition we were talking about in Massachusetts. That's why you have to be reading all over the zoning ordinance to get a, a feeling for what's really going on. So, uh, I just wanted to point out that your essential problem here is that you have to prove that you are not something. This, in philosophical terms, is a classic requirement that you prove the null hypothesis. You have to prove the absence of a fact. How do you prove the absence of a fact? Well, philosophically, it's impossible. But let's get over that and try. And the way to try is to look at the actual wireless communications facilities rules in Kootenai County, Idaho. First of all, uh, a WCF is not permitted in a residential zone. These little numbers off to the right that you can't read from the back of the room are just the sections, and they're there in case you really wanted to look up Kootenai County uh, yourself someday. The, well, you know, by and large, ham radio is going to occur in a residential zone if it's at your house, because your house is probably in a residential zone. It's got to be set back from a residence 300 feet. Well, that puts you in the business of buying one and seven eighths inch hard line. Uh, it's got to be set back from a residential parcel 150 feet. One wonders if they're going to count the parcel it's on as the residential parcel you have to be set back from, meaning do you have to be set back from yourself? Again, philosophical questions confront us. Not within two miles of a wireless communications facility. I don't know how the ordinary run-of-the-mill radio ham is gonna know where all the wireless communications facilities are, especially now that we have these little 5G mini cells. Uh, it has to be, this tower that you're gonna 
put up your TA-33 on, your little two-element, three-element tri-bander on, uh, has to be designed, the tower has to be designed for three additional providers. Well, I'm not sure that they can really require that, but it goes to helping you prove that one of these things is not like the other. You are not a WCF. And if the WCF rules also say that what you are proposing cannot violate the Telecommunications Act of 1946 with a citation, 47 U.S.C. Section 251. That's actually helpful because the Telecommunications Act of 96 was an amendment to the Telecommunications, to the Communications Act of 33, which governs ham radio. We are not 96 Act actors, as it were. So when you look at these other requirements, it helps you define yourself away from the WCF requirements. Here I have included the actual chart from a brief in the KD1MF case in Framingham, Massachusetts. We had to wind up in court. We litigated, got a favorable decision from the land court. And in my brief for KD1MF, I used this very same technique uh, two years ago. And uh, we successfully sold the court on the idea that ham radio was not a wireless communications facility. And what I did is I just went down all of these things. Um, for example, all service providers shall locate on a single tower. Now, must a radio amateur accept commercial carriers in order to put up a ham radio tower? Um, traffic shall not adversely affect abutting ways. Obviously, this was not designed for a ham radio tower. Um, shall not exceed an 80-foot above ground, AG, above ground. Uh, well, that's a firm fixed maximum height, which is illegal. Um, it has to be a minimum of 300 feet from a residential zoning district or residential use. We're back in the one and seven eighths inch hardline world because you have to put your tower a minimum of 300 feet from your house, which is craziness. I mean, this is crazy town. And that's what you have to explain to some of these uh, code enforcement officers, building inspectors, planners, and so forth. So I promised I'd run through it quickly. Thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you if you are ARL members. And if you're not, please join. And in the meantime, uh, at the end of our talk, I will have the bargain of the year, my book, which is $49.95 plus tax plus shipping from ARL or DX Engineering. I'll sell it to you for $40 cash.